they describe it in the training manuals as a tightness of chest. That's being overly nice. To me, it felt like my windpipe had constricted to the size of a straw. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. Ian Fawkes was exposed to the deadly nerve agent Sarin in 1983 at the Porton Down Chemical and Biological Defence Establishment. Porton Down is one of the UK's most secretive and controversial military research facilities. Ian describes in details the process and the ill effects this caused him and shares details of a little-known fatality where 20-year-old Ronald Madison died 45 minutes after what scientists thought was 200 milligrams of liquid sarin dripped onto his arm. We also talk about the development of chemical weapons during the Cold War and the history of Port and Down. Up to 20,000 people took part in various trials at Port and Down from 1949 up to 1989. In 2004, Madison's death was ruled to have been corporate manslaughter. The Ministry of Defence withdrew a challenge to this ruling minutes before the hearing. And in 2008, the Ministry of Defence paid 600 veterans of the tests £8,000 each without admitting liability. Now, if you think there's a vast army of research assistants, audio engineers and producers putting together this podcast, you'd be wrong. The podcast relies on your support to enable me to continue to capture these incredible stories and make them available to everyone for free. If you'd like to help to preserve Cold War history and enable me to continue, you can via a one-off or monthly donation. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more details. Do join our Facebook discussion group where the Cold War conversation continues between episodes. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Now, back to today's episode. I'm delighted to welcome Ian Falks to our Cold War conversation. We tend to use the term nerve agent rather than nerve gas, because gas is a specific way of delivering the toxic agent to an area, but it could come in other forms such as uh, aerosol, liquid, um, and so on. So we tend to use the term nerve agent. Now, the nerve agents themselves were discovered shortly before the Second World War by a German scientist called Schrader. And Schrader was looking for um, a more effective form of insecticide. And he started using different chemical compounds and he started developing what are now, the, or what at the time, were brand new organophosphates. He noticed that these were a thousand times more effective on insects than other insecticides that they were using at the time. So he decided to develop this further. Now, one of the things, one of the things that some of the readers might ask is why didn't the Germans use nerve agents during the Second World War? Well, that in itself is a bit of a minor mystery. But one thing that is known is that Schrader published his findings in um, peer-level periodicals, as scientists tend to do. And in America, the Americans were repeating a lot of this information. And then when the Second World War broke out, the Americans stopped publishing inf any information on their research. We believe that this actually led the Germans to incorrectly assume that we knew all about nerve agents already, um, when in fact we didn't. Now, there were three types of nerve agents that Schrader um, developed. They were called Soman, Sarin and Taben. And they were called GA, GB and GD. The G stood for German A, German B and German D. No one knows why there isn't a German C. Maybe there was and 
all the information was lost at the end of the Second World War um, with the capture and, dis- and attempted destruction of various records of um, scientific research. During the Second World War, you have this very strange situation where after Operation Bagration, Bagration or Bagration or however you pronounce it, the Russians are driving forward into into Germany. They've put the Germans back onto their own soil. Then something very strange happens because all of a sudden Stalin orders his troops to head towards Berlin. And you have two armies and he deliberately put these armies into competition with each other. One was led by Zhukov and they went hell for leather and captured Berlin. Now, why they suddenly changed isn't entirely clear, but most of the German scientific research institutes were based in Berlin. Certainly their nuclear research institute was there, and it is known that they had actually produced material capable of being used in an atomic weapon. This material made its way to America with the surrender of German forces. The other thing that besides there was, of course, the chemical research institutes, and all these were captured, not always with the scientists, of course, but the actual research material itself. And they went as far as removing the the experiment, the experimental chambers, the so, uh, you know the science labs, absolutely everything. They removed them brick by brick and moved them back to the east of the Ural Mountains. Now. This played into the Cold War, and the West were completely unaware of the nerve agents that Schrader had developed. So that's a sort of background potted history to how um, nerve agents were developed initially. These peer uh, publications, the had the Allies looked at them and thought, mm, probably not worth using as a weapon? The simple answer is we don't know. (laughs) The Germans came to that conclusion, which for us was a very handy thing because, as we now know, none of the issue, as they're called then, gas masks, would have filtered out any of the German nerve agents because we were completely unaware of them. Port and Down themselves have said it was the one time they were caught with their pants down. Yeah, because there's this theory that the Germans didn't use gas because of Hitler's experience of uh, being attacked with gas in World War One. Yeah, that 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 may possibly have fed into why it was never used. There has been some argument um, that maybe it was used twice on the Eastern Front, but didn't produce significant enough casualties for the Russians to even worry about recording it or for the Germans to have made any further um, experiments with it. Mo- moving on to the, the Cold War, the Soviets show significant interest in enhancing these nerve agents, don't they? Um, yes, they do. They're, they're incredibly keen to know more, um, as is the West. And the West realises that actually the Russians have got to march on us here because they're further down the line. They've had more time to research. And even then, you're only talking about two or three years. So a very short period of time, but they were further down. And when it was realised just how effective nerve agents could be, um, there was then a general rush by all sides to develop more efficient um, nerve agents, but also, just as importantly, the protection for their own troops against those nerve agents. Right. And was there any Geneva Conventions or anything against the use of poison gas or or nerve agents? I believe there was. Yes, there was. Um, The potential for the use of chemicals in military um, in, in, for military use was actually known well before the First World War. And there was um, an agreement or a treaty that forbade the use of them 
or more specifically, forbade the use of the militarization of them. So when the Germans attacked in 1915 on the Western Front, they used chlorine gas. All they did, their argument is, well, we didn't militarise it. We merely took the canisters to the front line and opened the canisters. So very much a play on words. And certainly there is the argument goes that when the British responded with shells loaded with um, Lewis site and various other chemical nasties, that we were the ones who first militarised chemical weapons. I think that's very. I think that's a very mealy mouthed um, way of ducking responsibility, because, in my opinion, those chemical agents that were first used were first used for a military purpose to um, obtain a defined military advantage. So the way in which it was used to me dictates that the Germans did actually militarize the chemical weapons first. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as far as the Cold War was concerned, both the Allies and the Soviets thought it was fair game to develop these weapons, regardless of the Geneva Conventions. Well, of course, the argument goes that, um, and I think there's actually quite some sound, if you like, reasoning behind this that the argument is well we're defending our troops against known potential agents that an enemy might use in the future well of course the to keep your knowledge at the top range to provide the best protection you can requires you to carry out more and more research developing new agents testing how effective they could be so the result is that the diff, you know, the line between research for defensive purposes that can then be used in offensive purposes is very, very narrow. It's easy to step over from the one to the other. Um, in Britain's case, it wasn't until I think it was the 1960s we then repudiated the use of chemical weapons. We said, no, we're not having any stockpiles. Everything is specifically for defensive purposes only. And um, Nance Cook was closed down effectively as the place to where chemical weapons would have been manufactured in the event of war. And we have no stockpiles of them. Right, but research continued, which we will uh, come on to. <laughs> oh, yes, the, the research continued. Um, and this, you know, if you put this into the wider perspective of the Cold War, this was just one potential tool in the use by all countries. The Americans, I wouldn't like to say were slower, but they've, they, but all sides tend to, sort of, chemical weapons don't really, fall into they fall into their own unique category um they're considered not as bad as nuclear weapons um but more controllable than biological weapons because biological weapons the first indication that someone might have used a biological weapon against you is when all of a sudden large numbers of people start falling ill now if you're going to use that on a on a battlefield one of the things you're going to want to do is protect your own troops. So one of the things to look at, a belligerent country towards you suddenly inoculating all their troops, why are they doing that? You know, so it's, it's a combat indicator, if you like, towards the use of a, a biological agent. The other thing is once a biological agent has been used, it's pretty unpredictable as to how effective it is going to be. It, it could be absolutely devastating or it could do absolutely nothing. With, um, with nuclear weapons, of course, their, their um, <clears throat> ability is well known. And against the backdrop of the Cold War, you have both the Warsaw Pact and for Warsaw Pact, read the Russians. 
going hell for leather to develop more and more nuclear weapons in the same way that the Americans do. So you have this the missile gap as being justification for building more and more and more weapons. Yeah, and chemical weapons were were classified as a weapon of mass destruction as well. They are. Um, they are classified that way. Um, I guess it's but, levels of mass destruction. Yeah, well, yes, it is. Um, but, I mean, it's a particularly nasty way of of killing people. Um, but with chemical weapons, you can um, also tailor them to have a different effect. So you might not necessarily kill people with them. Experiments have taken place into how effective um, for example, good LSD be on the battlefield. There is a, a film on YouTube showing some Royal Marines who've been exposed to LSD and they're, how they basically break their cohesion as a, a fighting unit breaks down completely. And so as an incapacitation weapon rather than a... A killing weapon. Yes. Um, and another another way is damaging, a damaging agent. Now, the particular one for that that everyone will have heard of is mustard gas. Um, again, we refer to it as blister agent these days. Um, the reason being with that, it's a particularly nasty one because unlike any other agent, blister agent is the only one that has a vapour contact hazard. Now, what that means is just if the vapour of it goes over your skin, after a while you will start to blister and you will blister horrifically. We're talk, you know, we're talking about a small amount on the back of your hand just becoming one enormous, um, enormous blister. The worst thing you could do is actually pop that blister because that then just spreads more blister agent further around and it's also highly carcinogenic and this was found out at um, Winterbourne Gunner where they used to carry out the training for the MBC instructors. Now I did my MBC instructors course in 94 and they had stopped what was called spotting. Now they used to take people into the into a chamber have them roll their sleeve up and they would then drop a single drop of blister agent onto the forearm of the potential instructor. They then had to carry out what was called block bang rub, which was our way of decontaminating, which was to take um, one of the decontamination kits. It was a pad that um, two part pad that you could slip your fingers in between. You'd use one side of it to block, block the agent up the other side to bang on a lot of fuller's earth and then wipe it away. Well, they would do that as they'd always trained, as they'd always practised. <clears throat> the instructor who was in there, the technician, carried on talking to them and then after five minutes invited them to look at their fo- the inside of their forearms and they had blisters developing. And the reason for that was they hadn't um, decontaminated properly. So it used to be a, a badge of honour amongst the old old and bold instructors that they would show you the scar on their forearm from the blister agent. How wonderful, look at I, yeah, I did this, what a hard man I am. The guy who was doing that spotting, as it was called, when he left the army, stayed on at Winterbourne Gunner as a civilian doing the demonstration. Now, the thing with this chap was that he spotted himself Every single course, he was the first one to drop blister agent on himself. He would then blot it up, show them, demonstrate the correct way to blot bang rub, get rid of it all. And he carried on with that as a civilian. He later retired and within a very short period of time of retiring, died of some fairly exotic cancers. And it was linked back to the fact that he was spotting himself on all these courses. So that was the way we found out that um, the blister agent is also highly carcinogenic. 
Now, the use of, of agents like Blister is that a simple, you know, a horrible rule of mathematics of war. It takes two soldiers to bury one dead soldier, whereas it takes 10 people in the casualty evacuation chain to, chain to take care of one soldier. So by sheer weight of numbers, you can grind an enemy down just by inflicting mass casualties on them, not necessarily killing all their army, but do, giving them so many casualties that their rear echelon support system just breaks down under the pressure. That's what I mean by being able to tailor your chemical warfare agents. On the one hand, you've got lethal, you've got the incapacitating, and you've got the damaging. What are the symptoms that a nerve agent causes? Typically, the first the first symptom that might come about, and there, there's a, and I've got to say here, there's a lot of variables. Um, the first one is simply the physique of the person being um, exposed. So you've got, th- you know, your young, thin racing snakes, and they will have less of a protection against nerve agent than those with more body fat. And we can, we can come back into that a, a bit later. But um, the physiology of the individual also comes in. But typically, the first symptom that um, people might notice is a tightness of the chest. Then pinpointing of the eyes. The pupils will pinpoint and it is highly noticeable. You will notice that someone has had nerve agent by the way um, the pupils contract. If you've um, been exposed yourself, um, the problems with vision um, are terrible. And again, we'll go into this a bit bit later. When um, the agent is developing more, the person exposed might might develop a, a bad headache, start excessive drooling, lose consciousness, loss of consciousness, and then um, what can best be described as muscle spasms, um, involuntary urination and defecation, and of course death. But you would see all those. You would see someone go through those symptoms. And everyone would have at least two of those symptoms, depending on their um, physiology. Wow, um, doesn't really bear thinking about. But we're we're going to move on to the role of Port and Down in the UK, which was uh, the main research establishment. Can you? Tell me much about what what they were up to and what tests they were carrying out, certainly in the early Cold War. Portland Down was established in 1915 as um, as a place to research not just offensive. Initially, it was defensive measures for our um, troops, and then it was offensive measures ag- against the enemy. Um, this research has carried on to the present day. So it carried on in between the wars, during both um, both world wars. And in some ways, it's, it's um, if you like, it's <clears throat> real justification came home with the advent of the Cold War. As I said, with this discovery of these nerve agents that Port and Down had known absolutely nothing about, there was a big rush on, and not just about the nerve agents, but looking at were there other chemical compounds that they'd also missed. Also, research into blister agent carried on. Now, people aren't really uh, um, aware of this, but we also had outstations in Canada, Australia, because we needed to see and find out how different agents reacted in relation to the environment and the terrain they were being used in? Did they act differently, for example, in um, a rainforest to how they would act on the prairies of Canada? Or what about in Australia? 
where you've got so many different types of vegetation, weather conditions, wind conditions, and so on. So it, it was truly a Commonwealth-wide research facility. And it was, it was necessary. It was definitely necessary because we could see by looking at the Warsaw Pact just how they were changing um, not just their equipment, but how that equipment would be employed. So you have the Russians being the first ones really to build into their nuclear in, into their tanks protection against um, nuclear fallout, for example, um, infantry fighting vehicles, the, the famous BMP. Of course, these were the first T fifty four, T fifty five. These were the first vehicles to have um, specific built in protection against chemical agents as well as well as nuclear how, how do they test the efficiency of the protection that nato and the west are trying to build for their soldiers against these agents port down has always had a um has made use of um human observers or put it another way human guinea pigs they would advertise for soldiers sailors airmen go to port and down be involved in research and then you get some money and a long weekend. Now, after the uh, after the, the Second World War, and with the discovery of nerve agents, the obvious thing was to carry on using these guinea pigs. Now, one of the things I want to make clear from the get-go is that those who were exposed to nerve agents are in a minority because they were also testing out things like treatment for nerve agent, if someone gave treatment incorrectly, and as you correctly said, the chemical protection, the type of suits they were used, that were used, and so on, all that was part of a long research process. Some of the things that did happen, quite frankly, beggar belief, for example, in India during the Second World War, one soldier was quite literally drenched in blister agent from head to foot completely drenched. Another soldier had um, blister agent sprayed onto his genitals to see the effect of, of that from going through contaminated areas, especially if they were a Scots regiment that wore kilts. So there was lots of different angles that they were trying to protect our soldiers from. And were, were these soldiers making informed consent around these tests? Well, what we can say is before the Second World, before and during the Second World War, we don't know, is, is the simple answer. I, I suspect not. After the Second World War, um, I'd say quite definitely not that we were in breach of the Nuremberg Code of Ethics on Human Experimentation. The reason behind that is, for those who don't know, the Nuremberg Code of Ethics on Human Experimentation came about as a result of what happened in the concentration camps um, during the war, where people had the, some of the most horrific experiments carried out on them, almost to the point where you question whether that was real scientific knowledge or just someone being a pure sadist and having the opportunity to um, abuse their position for their own enjoyment. With the code, one of the things, one of the most important things that came out was that um, the subjects had to be volunteers and they had to be given, they had to give informed consent. So that meant telling them um, that the full range of risks that could be involved, that could be involved with them taking part in that experiment. Were they given the opportunity to refuse? Again, this is um, an area of controversy. So if, if we start looking at, for example, the National Servicemen, the National Servicemen um, typically were recruited as subjects taking part in the common cold research. Now, of course, Porton Down isn't very far from Salisbury. And neither was the civilian establishment where common cold research was taking place. So it's my belief that um, 
certainly during the period of the national servicemen, that the common cold story, and it was going out on orders, was the cover story for what those um, national servicemen were doing. So to me, there was a quite um, obvious, if you like, abuse there simply on the grounds that um, these soldiers were going, soldiers, sailors and airmen were going to Porton Down. They were being exposed to nerve agent, but none of them were ever told it was nerve agent. And an example of one chap, a guy called Ken Earl, who um, set up uh, the Porton Down Veteran Support Group, um, when he went to Port, when he went to Porton Down, he was told it was common cold research. He had no hesitation that that's what it was. And it wasn't till years later, we're talking in the late nineties, early noughties, that he started to find out that actually he'd been exposed to a nerve agent, to sarin particularly. And I understand that one of these tests ended in tragedy at Porton Down as well. Um, yes, it did. Yes. Um, there's an airman called um, Ronald Madison. Um, he took part in a test. Now, Ronald Madison's case is absolutely unique in British history simply because after a lot of pressure, um, the Porton Down Veteran Support Group and other groups managed to actually get his original inquest overturned and a new inquest into his death took place. And one of the things that came out of the inquest was that um, Ronald Madison was part of an experiment to find out how much protection the standard issue battle dress that national servicemen were wearing at the time, how much protection that would give them against nerve agent. So he was taken into a chamber sat down at a table, rolled sleeve, had them, they were wearing boiler suits, they rolled the sleeve up on his arm and dropped 200 um, mils of liquid nerve agent onto his forearm. Now they then, this is, this is the bit I don't, I don't understand because to me this totally negates your research. They then taped over the liquid nerve agent the layers of cloth that he would have worn um, with with his battle dress. So he had his shirt material and a layer of serge, wool serge, on top of that, which they then taped over liquid agent they just dropped onto his arm. Now, to me, that's a bit strange because the idea of the experiment was to find out how much protection the material would give. So why drop it onto his his arm, why not put the material on first and drip the agent onto the material that then goes onto his arm? So um, to me, a bit of a back-to-face way of carrying out the experiment. Now, Ronald Madison's last words were, I feel a bit queer, um, and that was it. He went unconscious. He was taken to the um, medical centre at Porton Down where they tried to bring him back. Now, one of the chemicals that's used to counteract nerve agent poisoning is atropine, and atropine is developed from belladonna or deadly nightshade. And the the atropine counteracts some of the effects of the nerve agent. One of the things it does is it makes the muscles relax. It also dilates um, the pupils. Um, if you think back to the old dance, uh, the old um, dance halls in the sixties, girls used to drop a little bit of atropine, which you could you could buy over the counter back then, um, into their eyes to make their pupils dilate. Because one of the things that one of the ways to make you appeal more attractive to people is um, it's a subliminal message that if their pupils are dilated, it's because they want to see as much of you as as they can. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of those body language type things. Anyway, Madison collapsed. And I think it was a it was about quarter to 10 in the morning. 
and they were still trying to revive him at one o'clock. Um, he was dead, There's, you know, completely dead. With an autopsy, normally, um, I think it's seven pieces of human material are retained after the death. That's typically sort of slice of the brain, lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, those those sorts of things. You know, samples of those are retained. Um, the inquest found out that actually 57 um, body samples were retained after Madison's death, along with his entire spinal column. They removed his entire spinal column for further research. Now, the the inquest into this poor man's death um, itself was, was actually very, very interesting indeed. It was supposed to last six weeks, and it lasted nearly six months. Um, I went to I went along to it every day I possibly could. One of the one of the things that came out was that the chief statistician at Port and Down wrote to the director of Port and Down saying, "If you carry on these experiments at the rate you're carrying on, there's a ninety percent chance you will kill somebody within the next year." Um, and it was only a matter of weeks when they killed Madison. Madison, though, needn't have died simply because when he was wheeled into the um, he was wheeled into the hosp- the hospital at Port and Down, there was already a chap in there who had died, but they brought him back, a guy called Kelly, and he'd collapsed the week before, but they managed to revive Kelly and bring him back to health. He was still being nursed back to health um, at Port and when. Ronald Madison was brought in. So that's a pretty, to me, that's a pretty damning statement of how they went about. Now, all these national servicemen, again, going back to your informed consent, every single one of them that I've spoken to, not one of them has said they they told me it was nerve agent. So a very, very big ethical concern of how we conducted these experiments you served in the army in the 1980s and they were still testing on humans and you were one of those people can you describe your experiences certainly i was in the army from 1980 to 1999 um in 1983 i volunteered for Port and Down as it was a bit of a joke actually I never expected it to uh, to take off but it did um, so in the end of November beginning of December 1983 I went to Port and Down and the first week I was there it was um, the first day it was a series of tests to um, decide which experiment the scientists wanted to use us on. The tests consisted of things things like treadmill, lung capacity, um, eyes, reflexes, nerves, and so on. And there were three of us who were there at the time who were looked at. Um, one of the things with me was back then I used to be – um, a very good swimmer and I, I swam for the regiment I played water polo for the regiment um, I'd also done sabacqua before I joined the army so I had an excellent lung capacity and that was why they chose me for nerve agent the other two guys um, they were using those um, in experiments for medicines to counteract the effect of nerve agents so, of course, when they said to me, we'd like to give you nerve agent, um, unlike my forebearers in the um, national servicemen, national servicemen were not given really any training on, on, on chemical, nuclear, or biological weapons. They were just told if the alarm goes off, you put your stuff on. But they didn't tell them what symptoms to look for. Well, as the army got smaller and smaller and became more professional, 
they got to the point where you had to start teaching the soldiers about the chemical weapons simply so they could protect themselves. And I'd had a lot of training about chemical weapons. It started when I'd been a boy soldier at Harrogate, then at my first working unit. And they, every exercise we went on in Germany, you're wearing, we called them our noddy suits, or so chemical warfare suits. They were called noddy suits because they've got a hood on them that sticks up at the back and it looks like, um, makes you look a bit like Enid Blyton's noddy. So noddy suit. So if they'd exposed me without telling me, all of, I would have realised what was going on. So they told me, we'd like to experiment on you with nerve agent. Having had all this training telling me how lethal it was, um, I was more than a little bit concerned, shall we say. And I asked some very, very, as it turned out, pertinent questions. And I was probably one of the first to ask. But I asked what was the risk involved and what were the long-term health effects? Now, as soon as I said, oh, well, I, I want more assurance before we go into this, um, they stopped the interview. A scientist came in, or at least I was told he was a scientist. Um, if you haven't ever had a, a dictionary with photographs to show you definitions of different words, if you ever had scientists, this guy would have been there. You know, the bald bald-headed eggy type with glasses and a white coat. Um, this guy was that to the T. But looking back, he could just as easily have been the road sweeper. They could have gone out and bunged five quid, come in and told this guy to say that. I, you know, I had only their word. And, of course, we tend to take the word of people in authority as being genuine. Anyway, I'll see this question to the guy. And he then assured me that, Oh, don't worry about these tests. They, you know, they're they're harm they're harmless. You'll be a bit uncomfortable at first, but they're harmless. They're nothing to worry about. We've never had a problem. Well, no one mentioned anything about Kelly or Madison. If they had have done, I would never have taken part in the test. Never in a million years. And I asked, what was the long term health impact? They said, well, for the next four years, we'll monitor your health. You'll be coming back every year. We'll do these tests, that test, this test. Um, so we'll be keeping an eye on you. How how did the test go? Um, well, the first week was all um, what they call baseline tests. This was to get my everything they could about my body logged so that they knew what I was like before exposure. The tests were the tests themselves were very uncomfortable. There was one that involved reading the electrical flow um, through the synapse of the nervous system. Now, I'll give you a bit more detail about how um, nerve agents work. Is that nerve agents affect a thing called ethylcholinesterase? Now, whenever you make a movement. You know, some of them, are, of course, are subconscious, like breathing. What happens is when you, for example, you move your arm and you, you flex your arm. Some chemicals are released in the nerves that tell the muscles where to, where to move. And then when you get to that specific point, a counteraction, cholinesterase, then breaks down and stops the further chemical um the, the chemical reaction within the body. And when you think about it, it's, it's an absolute marvel of, of nature that such a system has developed. Well, nerve agents inhibit the cholinesterase. So when you're talking about the level of nerve agent poisoning, you talk about cholinesterase inhibition. And that's the, dis the destruction of the body's ability to um, make cholinesterase to counteract the ethyl cholinesterase. So when you do that, the body just starts twitching. And as I said to you earlier about the body twitching, the, sim the, um, the body literally breaks down because the nervous system cannot control the muscles. You then go into 
you know, your your lungs stop working, you can't control your bladder. Um, by then, you're unconscious anyway, and, and shortly afterwards, you die. So, one of the things was measuring the ethyl cholinesterase that involved putting needles into my forearms to read the electrical flow. I had so many blood samples taken from from me that um, for years afterwards I had elephant hide on the inside of both elbows because my um, skin had just become uh, just toughened over because of the amount of um, blood samples taken. Um, I was wired up to a, an ECG to see heart and lung. They also um, took electrical readings of, of my brain. Um, a very uncomfortable um, procedure involved having my head um, strapped into a clamp and being left in the completely black room for an hour to make the pupils dilate as far as they could. Then they came in and took a flash photograph of my retinas. So you can imagine that was exceedingly painful. Yeah. So with all that being all that being done, lung tests, blood, lots of um, samples. By the end of the first week, they had a very nice baseline body reading for my body at normal times. The following Monday, I was taken into the um, chamber, and I will say this in defence of Porton Down that I was given the opportunity to drop out at any stage. I could have dropped out. But having had the reassurance that all this was safe, I agreed to carry on. So I went into the chamber. We had to go through two airlocks. And I say we because um, a technician came in with me. He was um, masked up. He had an S6 respirator on. And he was there to check in case I collapsed then he could he could get me out in one corner of the gas chamber was some chemical apparatus that was obviously where the chemicals were mixing and producing um, the sarin nerve agent now they had an ester mixed in to give a, a specific aroma and although i can't describe the aroma to you i can say this that if i ever smelt it again i would run screaming in the opposite direction um because of what i associate with it so so the nerve agent is normally odorless so they'd added an odor so that you could know that you were breathing it in no it was so that the technician who was in there with me if his um, mask wasn't working properly he could detect that and get out right understood yeah, so it was for his protection, not not mine. Um, now, I, I was in the chamber for a total of 30 minutes. Um, now, I've had people tell me that I'm a liar, that I, I couldn't have been in there for that long, I'd be dead. Um, I can assure you it, it was 30 minutes. I've got a letter from, um, from Dara or DSL or whatever they were, um, confirming that that was the length of my exposure time. Now, while I was being exposed, the first symptom I noticed um, was they describe it in the training manuals as a tightness of chest. That's being overly nice. I felt, to me, it felt like my windpipe had constricted to the size of a straw. So breathing was very, very laboured indeed. And at this stage, my eyesight wasn't affected, but it was mainly my um, my windpipe. And, and that was in itself was quite distressing, especially because having been a swimmer and so on, um, I had very good breathing technique, if you, if you like. So... To suddenly have your windpipe closed down like that was um, quite alarming. At the end of the half an hour, I was taken outside. Um, by this time, I was getting what they refer to as 
dimness of vision. Um, this was my pupils starting to contract. At their narrowest point, I th if I remember correctly, they were a millimetre wide, my pupils. You couldn't see anything. Um, experience told you if you went into a room um, that that must be a chair and that must be a table, but you couldn't see them. It was just experience telling you what they must be. Couldn't see them. It was, it was, you saw distorted colours at best. And that was it. Um, by this stage, I had a blinding headache. As soon as um, I'd come out of the chamber, they repeated all the tests that they, that they carried out on me during the previous week. So I had blood samples taken. I had the electrical measurements through the synapses read. I had uh, the, the flash photography taken of, of my retinas. Um, and I was not very well. In, in fact, I was so ill that um, when I returned to the accommodation that afternoon, um, the, the guys had to help me down to... Um, to the canteen to get me fed. Um, now they they were obviously used to seeing this sort of thing at the at the canteen. Um, feeding myself was quite hard to say the least. I went back to the accommodation, not feeling at all well. And then about six o'clock, um, I was so ill that the guys who were keeping an eye on me dragged me down to the med centre. And they called in a doctor to look at me. And he was quite concerned, but um, said there's nothing we can do about the eyes. There was, in fact, he could have given me um, eye drops, but um, he convinced me not to have anything like that. He must, must have been a used car salesman, that guy. Um, and he, uh, they took me back to the accommodation where I didn't sleep very well at all that night. Um, I was very, very sweaty and I was drooling quite a lot. Um, when you start getting into the overall list of symptoms that I had constrict, constriction of, of my chest, so I had difficulty breathing, I was salivating a lot, I had a blinding headache, my eyes were pinpointed, you're now getting up towards the very serious signs of um, nerve agent poisoning. So the following day, I was back down to the um, med centre where they were carrying out all the readings. They could see I wasn't very, very well. Um, they were con they were concerned about that, but it was all another round of tests, another round of tests. By the Wednesday, my eyes uh, were. Um, all I can really say is they were settling down. Um, they weren't dilating, but the brain was becoming more used to um, how the information was being developed to it. So my vision started to clear more. Um, and that was it. They flashed photography of my eyes um, and so on. Now, when I got home um, after that uh, after Port and Downer finished with me and I was sent home, my my mum, who, who, bless her, was a nurse, took one look at me and didn't like what she saw. And she wanted to take me to the hospital to get me checked. And I said, no, can't do that. Can't do that, mum. And I, I gave her a piece of paper which which said that if there's a problem, phone this number. Um she should have kept the paper. She didn't. Unfortunately, she she lost it because every now and again she we have a little bit of a joke about it. Um, but the the thing that was funnier, I think, was on the way home. I had to stop at uh, St Pancras Station to get the train the train home. Now, a big thing with the police at the time was that they were looking for drug users. So there I am with a, a grip, you know, a, a holdall sitting down on a station 
I've got pinpointed eyes. I'm sweat, still sweating like crazy um, and looking a bit doolally, a bit spaced out. And, of course, this policeman came, came over and started giving me the third degree about it. You know, what's this going on? Blah, blah, what have you taken? This sort of thing. And I gave him that particular piece of paper that I was on about, and they went away. Um, whether or not they made a phone call or not, I don't know. But they gave me the paper back and um, sent me on my sent me on my merry way to uh, to go home. On the Monday, of course, I flew back out to Germany where I was based. Wow! Well, and how long did it take you to overall recover from those symptoms? Well, the the immediate symptoms, like the tightness, the tightness of chest, went fairly quickly, from from what I remember. The pinpointing of the eyes and the headache were undoubtedly the worst. Um, the headache, I think, went by. I think the uh, Tuesday, late on Tuesday, early Wednesday, but the pinpointing of the eyes was still there um, many weeks after I'd returned to Germany because people were commenting on it. God, your eyes are funny. And that's why. Um, I then went back to Port and Down for a week each year following my exposure where they did all these tests again. Of course, they were looking at how the body had recovered from its um, cholinesterase inhibition, what were the eyes doing, and so on. Um, and that happened for four years, and then we parted our merry ways, and and that was it. Um, the last person to be exposed to nerve agents at Port and Down was exposed in 1989. Um, by contrast, the Americans stopped uh, experimenting with nerve agents on their troops in um, the late 50s. It's incredible they were continuing through to 1989, and... Were the the servicemen involved, including yourself, given compensation or any recompense over what went on? Um, we were we were eventually, um, as I said, the um, Port and Down Veteran Support Group, which which I joined, uh, being run by Ken Earl. We we were able eventually to bring enough pressure to bear that the inquest into Ronald Madison was reopened. Well, that made British legal history because it was um, 50 years between death and a new inquest. That kind of gap had never happened before. Um, I mean, for example, it was 30 years to the year between myself and Ronald Madison. Um, so it's an example of how quiet this had actually been kept. With the with the inquest being reopened, as I, as I said earlier, um, it was supposed to last six weeks. It lasted six months. Um, the solicitor, or rather the barrister for the MOD, um, she was the high private eye, found out she was the highest paid barrister in the country that particular year. Um, and, it's, and at times I felt very sorry for her because um, it was clear that the MOD hadn't been keeping her completely up to date with um, things that were going on. The prime thing that sticks in my mind there was um, was one of the uh, veterans was in the witness box giving evidence, and he said, well, what were you, she said to him, what were you tested with? And he replied, well, I was uh, exposed to LSD. And there was objection. That isn't true, and she she then gave this long spiel that it never it's never been f proven that Port and Down was involved in L LSD tests like the American MK Ultra tests. This never happened. It didn't. Blah blah blah. And the chap in the witness box started laughing. Um, a guy called Eric Gow, who was part of the legal team for us started laughing and the guy next to me in the interested parties box started laughing and the reason for that was they'd all just been given a check for eight thousand pounds and a letter of apology from mi5 and mi6 
for having experimented on them with LSD without their knowledge. Here's eight thousand pounds compensation. Go away and don't ever darken our door again, kind of thing. So she wasn't even aware that Porton that it had been admitted that yes, Porton Down did experiment on people, and in this case, it seems without their knowledge. Ian, I really appreciate you sharing your experiences there. It can't be that easy to to relive that sort of experience. Um, well, it's got easier with time. Um, with me, it made me quite evangelical because, as I said, I, w- I went on the NBC instructor's course at Winterbourne Gunner. And my reason for that was because I had such a bad experience with nerve agent and what it did to me that it made me quite determined never if it, if it was within my power never to let anyone else suffer the way i did and as i said i've i've had people you know usually nbc instructors say to me you're lying you cannot have been exposed for 30 minutes um well i've got the letter from dera to prove that i have um that that was the case um and this this is this is where you see you, you do yourselves a disservice by exaggerating if you like the threat now when you're training people to protect themselves in the chemical situation the first thing they've got to do is get the mask on straight away so they can carry on breathing well if you go around saying well yeah this one will take that time people become blase they won't make it urgent now we had a saying be in time mask in nine so that's mask up in nine seconds hydrogen cyanide which is a blood agent that will kill you in 10 seconds so you take that because it's the biggest threat you work to that timing well with nerve agents they don't necessarily as a scene they don't necessarily kill you immediately it depends on um, the physiology of the individual and also how it was delivered and so on. Now, going back to um, Ronald Madison, like most of um, the young men of his generation who were doing national service, they'd gone through the war, so they were quite lean, if you like. They had very little body fat, and it's known now the body fat actually – um, helps protect you against um, nerve agents and the effect on their body. In fact, the Germans, when they were exper- experimenting and researching their nerve agents, gave all the workers an extra ration of fat to help build up their protection against nerve. Um, I'll go back to this business with with Madison, and this came out at the inquest that he had 200 mils of liquid sarin dropped onto his forearm and then taped over with um, battle dress material. And as I've said, I think that's a crazy way of doing it because they were trying to extrapolate. Um, They didn't intend to kill Madison, obviously, but they were trying to find out how much battle, uh, how much, liquid nerve agent needed to penetrate a battle dress to kill somebody. Now, they obviously didn't intend to kill him. They intended to get a whole series of readings and then extrapolate from there. So he was just one of a group being experimented on. Well, it came out at the inquest that Port and Down were making their own pipettes. And to make matters worse, there was no calibration for them. So the scientists were doing things by eye. So he could have had 200 mils of nerve agent dropped onto his forearm. It could have been 150. It could have been 250. They don't know for sure. The next thing that came out was that if you actually take material over liquid nerve agent, it increases its toxicity level by a factor of 1,000. So that 200 milligrams 
has suddenly shot up considerably. Taping that to his arm, they'd have been better off playing Russian roulette. He had more of a chance. And again, going back to his physiology, there was no fat on him. If you see photographs of him, a very lean individual. Um, When he died, it put his whole family into poverty because his siblings were all sisters. And uh, only one of them is still alive. uh, At least I think she's still alive. She was at the time of the inquest. Um, But quite understandably, she just wanted an end to it because her, you know, she just remembered her younger brother went away into the military and never came back. I believe very strongly that what Porton Down has, has, has carried out requires a public inquiry to make sure that something like that never happens again and that at the minimum, the Nuremberg Code of Ethics on human experimentation is passed into our law. We also need, I believe, and again, very, very strongly, I believe that we should have medallic um, recognition for both the Port and Down veterans and the nuclear test veterans. Both are considered really as embarrassments to the government, regardless of which party. And it is time to bring us out of the shadows and to point out that According to the government, we knew Port and Down veterans knew exactly what they were being exposed to. In the case of the nuclear test veterans, we already knew from Hiroshima and Nagasaki the devastating effects of nuclear weapons. Surely this deserves to be recognised with medals for the contribution of all concerned. If anyone should be interested in asking me more questions, further questions, I'll be very delighted to answer them if you could contact me via the website. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.